Hello and welcome. My name is Peter Sumpton, marketing consultant and Lego master of marketing. And you're listening to the Marketing Study Lab podcast live. Well, this bit isn't live, but the rest of it is. You'll hear a bit about that later. I mean, now. Well, let's crack on. These episodes are taken from my live show, Marketing And, where we look at the relationship between marketing and a specific topic, subject or specialism. Sometimes there'll be guests, other times it'll just be me. So let's get cracking. Right, apparently we are live. Fantastic. Great. Exciting. (laughs) I know, first first time. Uh, M. Wilson, welcome to LinkedIn Live. It's wonderful in here, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely (laughs) marvellous. So glad you'd say you'd do this. Um, Really looking forward to it because I know you've put a lot of time and effort into the research into this. And every time you post something (laughs) in terms of the history of marketing and all that kind of stuff, um, it's really engaging, really exciting, um, and I just can't wait to see what you've got for us today. But I'm going to chip in with a few things as well, if you don't mind. Um, but before we do that, first yeah. of all, introduce yourself to the lovely audience. Who okay. are you? Well, I'm going to take a screenshot so everyone knows that we're live, and I can stick it on my uh, on my social media first. Cool, love it. <laughs> I was looking at the camera there. How rude <laughs> is that going to look? It's all it's <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I don't look great either, to be fair, it's fine. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, introduce myself. So, um, M. Wilson, uh, I run uh, an international marketing agency called Amari, amari.co.uk. Um, and yeah, bit of a bit of a weird and wonderful um, squiggly career into marketing. Mm. So, um, started in the commercial team at BP and trading. So I was a buyer, and then um, went into strategy for Europe for Castrol. Then I did some global social media for BP. Then I took a tech startup through a successful investment round, uh, and then I did six months with a as a marketing director and business development manager. And then uh, yeah, walked out and started Amari. <laughs> <three Yeah. years>. <laughs> as you do. Where does the name Amari come from? Um. So. Uh, in honesty, it's a bit of a smush of my my name and my husband's name. So we okay. met on the first day of uni, um, and yeah, we were just always always a Mari. So that was cool. you know because we were a couple from day one. So yeah. absolutely love it. <laughs> great, great, great little story that absolutely love it. Fantastic. Um, and how is life in general then? Yeah, really good actually. Uh, I mean, I think I'm you know I'm in a bit of a COVID bubble because I don't really I don't really know anyone that's been affected. Touch wood. Um, and and in honesty, although we've had you know some struggles, I think everyone's had some struggles during COVID. Um, you know, lots of our clients uh, have have uh, you know we've had to stop projects and and do payment plans and things like that. But overall, I think yeah, like it's not the bit I've missed most is actually my Latin dance classes, which is out of everything you know it's not a lot to complain about is it really <laughs> <laughs> if anyone was ever going to come on here and say I'm missing my Latin dance, dance classes yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's all like that's the only thing really and I'm being able to hug people as well because I'm just <laughs> a person um and I'm really struggling with not being able to sort of cuddle people because you know they're, my, they, they made it into the best man speech at my wedding was like the you know the legendary Emma cuddles so <laughs> yeah but apart from that and you I like it with you yeah, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, yeah, all all good. Um, bit of a cold, which is a bit of a downer. But apart from that, all is all is good with life, to be fair. Busy, 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 which is always fun and always exciting. Um, but yeah, things are, things are going pretty damn good. Again, similar to you. Um, can't complain. Touch wood. My own little bubble. That kind of stuff. Um, but have been infiltrated by a cold. Yes. Um, but apart from that, all all is really good, right? Okay, we should really talk about some serious stuff, shouldn't we? Or give people watching at least something to keep them engaged, <laughs> rather than our life stories. Um, so, what I wanted to talk to you today about. So, the way I'm doing these lives is that it's kind of like a marketing and series. So okay. this this is classed as marketing and history, but that doesn't really do it justice. So I think. The great thing, and, and anyone that doesn't uh, follow uh, M, please follow her and go back through some of her videos and some of her posts about some historic elements in marketing and how it's been used through history and time and stuff like that. It's amazing. And plus, take a look at the videos where she just picks something at random that uh, a client has asked. Because you'll probably <laughs> gleam a lot of information from them. It's pretty much how I do all my strategies, to be fair. <laughs> Watch your videos and then pick something out of a bowl and go, 
Yeah, that's about right. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, that's For anyone that's watching, I don't do that. <laughs> um, okay. But so what I want to do is is dive into kind of the history of marketing or, or certain elements of, of the history or certain things you've found that's really interesting and fascinating that we might even learn from. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, take it away. What what would you say is like, let's start on a high, the most exciting thing or the most interesting thing that, you, that, you, that you've seen recently in terms of marketing and history? Um, so I'm I'm a really big fan of um, the custom magazine. So that I I've got it. I've got a lot of time for that. And okay. basically, it's different companies creating magazines for their particular target audience because okay. it's a really interesting. There was a brilliant book by Joe Paluzzi that talked about how do you make marketing a profit center, and um, one of the ways you do that is through a magazine that you get people to pay for. And um, so that got me like hooked. Like, where did it start from? You know, obviously we had the Gutenberg Press in 1450 or whatever it was. So, uh, and then everyone always talks about the, the furrow, which started in I think it was 1895, which was a tractor magazine and sold loads of stuff about tractors. But actually, the first um, the first magazine I can find was in 1730, and there was a race between Ben Franklin and this other guy to who could get the first published magazine in America. <laughs> which is, I found really fascinating. So he he started that off. So that was quite nice. And then um, with the magazines, like what I found quite interesting about that was just how, like, in if you think about the 1730s, like the only way that people could really market it was like word of mouth. It was, um, you know, posters on the side of buildings, <laughs> which actually got, um, it got so bad because people were doing it so often that it actually got banned in London and France. Wow. <laughs> Just cool. London and France. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one else had posters. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that I found really interesting. And then, um, you know, the adverts from like the 1800s as well. Um, so there was, I found out about this whole thing about the baking powder wars, um, which is really yeah. exciting. Yeah. So baking powder in like the, you know, late 17, 1700s, early 1800s was this, like the adverts are nuts. Like they're just so, because what you don't realize is that you know, baking powder was like female liberation at the time. Because like a woman's work is actually defined by the quality of her bread. So like baking powder was incredible. And it, so it was so competitive. And like you look at all the adverts and they're just, they're just insane. They're just mm -hmm. really fun um, in terms of the different things that they did. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's kind of, then you move on and you kind of have um, obviously the posters and everything. All the adverts from the magazine went out into the posters and then the posters got banned. So then we had the billboard um, and the billboards came out in like 1860s. Um, so I think that the first one was rented in 1867. And what I find amazing about these things is that, you know, like if you think however many years later, so 2010, Mini like the car company, literally glued an actual mini to the top of a billboard as sort of, you know, shout out marketing, think outside the box. And I just, you know, you see all these things that happened in sort of, yeah, the 17, 18, 1900s and how that kind of came through. Like telemarketing, sorry, I'm on a roll now. <laughs> Go for it. But like telemarketing, everyone thinks that's like 1970s, 1980s, Wolf of Wall Street. Mm. No, started in the early 1900s by a bunch of housewives who wanted to sell more cookies. Yeah, so not even joking. Um, <laughs> so um, there was amazing. a company that um, had, um, they, they basically sold the original lead list of, uh, you know, local directories. And these ladies would just ring each other up and say, you know, my recipe is better than yours. Do you want to buy my cookies? Wow, <laughs> that's, that's nice. <laughs> I, I I just I find it fascinating how um you know we overcomplicate marketing like we we just do massively and and I always find it interesting to go back to its roots and and original where it all came from and and all that kind of stuff and from from what I know and what I found is that there's no no one can give you a definitive this is where marketing started this is how this grew yeah there's like telemarketing or posters and stuff like that mm -hmm. but it's usually someone's doing it in one country or someone's doing it over here at the same time roughly the same time or whatever it is and, and they derive something slightly different and I just think it typifies what marketing is all about mm -hmm. you know trying new things testing new things trying to stand out yeah. um, but to a particular audience and I think it's really interesting that if you read the history and go try to go back as far as you can, there isn't a 
well, this person said this, and that led to that. <laughs> there are certain elements, but there's almost it's almost hearsay, if you like. Yeah. And that I think that's the bit I find I find fascinating about it. And the bit I really enjoy about like the history of marketing particularly is just its effect on society. Like I, I don't think, you know, so like um I always go back to the toothpaste analogy. So um advertising actually saved the teeth of a nation. Okay. Um, so well, you're gonna have to explain um, that. <laughs> it's my favorite story, one of my favorite stories. <laughs> But, um, you know, so back in the early, early 1900s, again, um, only like 7% of um, Americans brush their teeth every day, which just seems insane. Yeah. And then this guy um, called, I think his name was Claude Hopkins or something, but he, um, he basically got asked to advertise some toothpaste. But obviously, nobody really got it. They didn't really understand why they needed it. So um, he went and read, read a load of dentistry books, which was really boring. And he found out about plaque and how it leaves like the film on your teeth. Mm -hmm. So he is actually one of the earliest examples of the cue and reward um, advertising and marketing that we can find, or I've found to date. Um, so the cue is if you feel the film on your teeth, then the reward is brush with Pepsodent and get like the tingly clean feeling. Okay, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and so by the end, so it was all sort of um, do the tongue test, I think was his tagline. Um, and he, in, like within a decade, 65% of Americans were then brushing their teeth every day. And he also, you had like the beginnings of influencer marketing because Clark Gable was known for his Pepsodent smile, Shirley Temple, you know, all of these people. So, yeah, it's just, I think that's, it's sort of the Mad Men era that I really enjoy. <laughs> yeah, it, and, and we, it, it's it weird. And things have slightly changed for, from when I was, was being educated in marketing, <laughs> if, if you want to call it that. But it's like, I'd say a lot of people get into the industry because of that Mad Men era, which is a bit bizarre. <laughs> and I think it's slightly changed now. But And it's more, I suppose, of a, a um, Zuckerberg era, if, if you like. And that's why people get into it, whether they fall into it by accident or, or they want to. But I was hugely influenced by the fact that the psychology behind marketing and how it can have a massive influence on, well, actually a nation, like you just said, yeah. Um, to the point of view that it, it changes culture, and that's what I did. It changed culture. People yeah. started cleaning the teeth. <laughs> that's that's mad. Yeah, that's, um, that, I mean, that was the bit in the Social Dilemma. I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix yet, but that's. I mean, that just makes you want to throw your phone out the window. Um, <laughs> it's talk, talking about all the data that people get from uh, from your social media channels and stuff. But um, I the so, bit yeah. that I thought was really interesting about that was it wasn't that the consumer was the was the main thing, like getting more customers wasn't actually the main thing. It was behavioural change mm. that was what it was all kind of focused on. And I thought that was, yeah, just really interesting. But I, I look to the the old the old marketing. So Mad Men is usually associated with the 1950s, isn't it? I was talking about sort of the, the Victorian Mad Men mm. as I sort of see them. Oh, okay. Um, but and also like think about Michelin. So, like, um, the tyres, they started their um, publication in 1904 um, because they wanted people to go explore, so they'd wear the tyres out more often so that they'd, you know, sell more tyres. Yep. And now it's like the industry standard or gold standard for restaurants and things it's like mad that. It's mental. <laughs> How much it's changed over the space of 100 years. And and, and that's it, 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 makes, it makes me laugh, um, like, today when... You, you hear people come up with some crazy ideas or crazy concepts within within marketing or everyone thinks that that's what we do we draw stuff we call stuff in we come up with stupid ideas yeah. kind of, we kind of do but there's a lot of there's a lot of theory and methodology behind that yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah it, it, imagine going into a boardroom and like just on the face of it saying right we're a tire company what do you want to do i know what we're gonna do <laughs> we're gonna give restaurants rewards <laughs> What? How, how does that work? Like, but the theory behind it is absolutely bang on. When you tell people that story about that's how the the, the stars came about and all that kind of stuff, okay. it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> and and that's what really fascinates me about like the history of marketing is the fact that you look at various things and and most people like the toothpaste for example, they probably thought he was crazy. Like you're never going to get people to clean their teeth, <laughs> but doing his research. And bringing it forward to what people gather data for and its behavioural change, that's pretty much what he did. He went back and read books and said, right, okay, this is a thing that I feel can influence people to change the way they think about their teeth. Yeah. But also what I love about that one particularly is like 
the dentistry books he read, uh, he said in his autobiography that they were like so dry because it was just all about like mucin in plaque and like, ugh, just sounds horrible. <laughs> by making it, you know, by calling it the film, like anybody can understand that. Anybody knows when you rub your, your tongue across your teeth exactly how that feels. You know, if you've had a glass of red wine or something, you can feel it, can't you? <laughs> yeah. So it, it was that, it was, you know, making, I think sometimes with marketing, it is just about making the complex simple. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly like that's the, you know, that's the, the the challenge that keeps me in interested in in what I do is a lot of my work is actually how do you take this really sort of techie complicated thing and make it Emma friendly I call it but, yeah, <laughs> you know sort of anybody could understand it um, and I think that's that's the important bit of uh, a bit of marketing and I think also like the other thing that we learn from the history is to play to your strengths. So, um, you know, if you think about, um, you know, post-World War, you had the the VW, the Volkswagen. Mm. How do you sell a, you know, a, a, a little German car that's pretty rubbish in comparison with its, you know, Western counterparts? Um, and, you know, and it's got a horrible name, mm, <laughs> you know, yeah. Planet. And, and what you do is you, you call it a VW and all of the copy around those adverts were about the fact, yes, it was very small and no, it wasn't going to go very fast, but it was reliable and it wasn't going to need a lot of upkeep. So for people in post-war, you know, post-war Britain, post-war America, it was actually, as, as long as you called it VW, not Volkswagen, actually, <laughs> it, was a lot, it was a lot easier to, to get that, that message across and actually became... It became a bit of a personality symbol, a bit like the mini is now. Mm. Um, you know, for people, it's a bit quirky. And, you know, mini really, I think they actually took the lessons from VW from the 50s and, and sort of brought that sort of into its own in the sort of the 2010s. And mm. because um, they were, they were you know, really playing on the, on the mini's sort of quirky personality. Um, yeah, yeah. That's really, I, I really enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I just, again, I mean, there's so many lessons we learn through looking at history and what's gone before us and all that kind of stuff. And we should always be looking forward, don't get me wrong, but looking back to that. And, and again, the simplicity of marketing is, you know, you've got something that solves a problem. How do you get it into the hands of the people that have that problem? That that's it. You know, that's all we're here to do, through various methods or whatever. And 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 pretty much that's what VW did. They're like, okay, we've got this car. It's not going to suit everyone. It just isn't. It fundamentally isn't. And we don't want to say Volkswagen because that is far too German. So how how do we get into this UK and this US market? Right, we're going to need a name change. Fine, tick. But it's it's too small for most. So we're not targeting big families. We're not targeting people that want to do long journeys. Let's just be really focused and targeted on the people that that may want this. And let's make our comms about them and how this car isn't made for everyone. And straight away, you're you're, you're in a select club because it isn't made for everyone. Yeah, you have to opt in. Yeah. And what I, love, what I love about those adverts as well is they really understood the power of white space. So like mm. if you look at their adverts, it's literally like a four page and it's this tiny little car in the top right hand corner. <laughs> and then there's a little bit of text at the bottom. I mean, talk about minimalism. It was, you know, it was cutting edge really in terms of like in terms of the messaging in terms of the copy I, I bow down to those guys they were they you know absolutely incredible with what they did but also you know sometimes you can solve a problem too easily so mm-hmm. you know turning what you just said on its head a little bit yeah 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 no go for it <laughs> so if you think um another foodie one but if yeah. you think about Betty Crocker so um when she started because obviously you know after after the telephone we had the radio um and then you obviously went to TV um, and what was interesting about that was that um, when she started with her cooking mixes in the early 50s, um, you know, all the all women had to do um, was add water. And mm-hmm. they thought, well, this is, you know, they thought this is going to fly off the shelves. It's going to be amazing. Um, you know, it's going to make life so much easier for women and they can just, you know, sit back, have a, have a couple of gins or whatever they want to do. Um, and actually it was too easy. Um, and and their their sales didn't didn't do anything at all. So they had to actually add an egg. That became the thing was add an egg, <laughs> and then because then it, it was something about adding two ingredients that made women feel like they'd been involved. Because okay. what they were suffering from was a form of guilt. Like it's too easy. I'm getting great feedback on my amazing cake that I didn't make. This is Betty. Okay. <laughs> but by adding an egg, <laughs> I don't know why. There's some psychology in there somewhere. Yeah. But- um, that made it that made it they felt more invested and, and therefore it flew off, off the shelves after that even that that's understanding your audience isn't it going back yeah. to what we were saying it's just understanding yeah. the market that you're serving and 
learning from your mistakes, I suppose. <laughs> You've yeah. taken it too far. Um, but just... also taking on feedback because they could have just carried on flogging it with the ad water. Mm -hmm. and they could have just, you know, you could have just seen more and more adverts coming out about that. But it was actually going to the customer base and going, why don't you like this? Um, and, exactly. you know, actually making the making the, the effort and the point to not assume that they knew the answer. I think that's the really key point to take away from that example, actually, is and, and like in today's society, I think because we're just so data driven, you mm. know, you you've got robots pretending to be humans and humans pretending to be robots and we get so stressed about the data we actually just forget to talk to one another um yeah. and that's you know such a such an incredible um you know the feedback you can get from your clients and, and prospective clients you know every conversation you can learn something quite interesting mm. um yeah really important. <laughs> I, I, absolutely so just just a quick hello to uh james who was on <laughs> last um last friday and we had good, uh, well, I'm going to have to say we had good crack because he's Irish and he'll kill me if I don't say good crack. Um, at least once on this show, that was the contract I had to sign. Um, so he asked a question and I've got no idea the answer to this, but this will be interesting. So what in history was the first most recognizable brand? <sighs> That's a bit of a big one, isn't it? Um, so, I mean, that's a Wikipedia question. And to be perfectly honest, I'd be amazed um, if <laughs> there wasn't know. if there was an actual answer to that. And from by that, what I mean is that there's probably recognisable brands going back way, way, way. I mean, it's it's yeah. probably going to be something like Coca Cola or something. No, that was it, my first thought. But then when they first started, they only sold like they didn't sell many bottles at all, did they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So I'm 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 just trying to think of like uh, I, I think. Coca-Cola took the brand and made a thing, like in terms of what brand can do, because that is bigger than the actual rubbish that they sell, isn't it? Uh, yeah, sorry, Coca-Cola, if you're listening. Right. <laughs> so, it's so not all rubbish. Be green, and then now he's now he's red because that was Coca-Cola, wasn't it? That's always the. I don't know if that's actually true. That might be myth and legend rather than actual true fact. But... No, I think it's true. <laughs> I think it's true. It's, it, it, well, they seem to claim it, it's true, but he does yeah. follow it up with that. So I don't know whether he's on Wikipedia or not. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we thought it was Coca-Cola as well. But I think that massively depends on the country as well, because yeah. there was probably recognisable brands in the. Um, in the in the UK that weren't necessarily in US or, or whatever. Nice but having said that, um, well, we've got some great participation now, so we'll just shut <laughs> up and I'll just keep clicking, shall I? So he comes up with this one, which it's probably right <laughs> thinking about it. It was probably alcohol. It was probably a vice. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, something that's not good for you. Cause yeah, <laughs> like I'm thinking cigarettes maybe. <laughs> Well, those um, weren't considered bad, were they, when they first came out? They were and that's, that's what I mean, but it's still a vice, which <laughs> yeah. I was going to come on to in a minute. We'll come back to, to, to smoking, in, in a, not actual smoking. Um, <laughs> but um, but um, Emma says that it could be Ford, yeah. Um, yeah, which is quite interesting, um, although she says it's too late, probably. I'm, I'm not quite sure about... Um, she means Ford, not her answer. <laughs> um Ford, I think Ford took the, from my point of view anyway, I'm not sure what you think about this, Anne, but I think from F Ford took the fact that brands probably know consumers better than they know themselves. Yeah. And what they actually want. What? Thinking about it, um, you probably, uh, so if you think like uh, in terms of brand, um, something like tea, I've just had a look at... Um, uh, on, I'm just on the Time uh, uh, Time uh, website at the moment. And what Full disclosure. Is, absolutely, yeah. Like Google is your friend. Um, so Stella Artois was apparently that their logo was first used in 1366. So wow. they are the oldest brand that Times found anyway. Um, but what they said was actually, yeah, Twining's Tea. That was 1887. Huh. Uh, if you think about sort of the trade routes and stuff, yeah, that kind of makes sense to me. Actually. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. So, I think, <laughs> I we think, no, like if someone asks a question, I don't know the answer. Like, right, <laughs> straight on. But Chrissy says, Lyle's gone syrup. That's got that's got to be down that somewhere. That has got yeah. to be. I think it's not going back as far as Stella or Twinings, but that's got to be somewhere. Yeah. So. Definitely. So, okay. Thanks, James, for that question. You've kind of ruined the whole show there, but you know, we'll we'll let you off. No, no, no. I, I, any further questions? 
like please please dive in because some yeah. of those were if anyone does actually know if anyone's got anything different from Stella or Twinings that would be interesting yeah. to know um I mean fact we only deal with facts <laughs> um absolutely so just going back to smoking go on then um not that I'm gonna but, um, <laughs> never have never will but I find it really interesting and, and I'm going to bring this to the modern day but I find it really interesting that smoking was always seen as a a positive thing to do and a health thing and the fact that uh, menthol cigarettes were so you could have fresh breath and stuff yeah. like that and I find it really interesting that some things we take today um and I'll get your take on the smoking thing in a minute, but some things we take today, so things that were fundamentally made up, like, um, I think I mentioned this in a previous show, but breakfast, most important meal of the day. Well, mm -hmm. I wonder where that came from. <laughs> um, would it be research that was conducted and sponsored by cereal manufacturers <laughs> by, by any chance? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So no wonder it's the most important deal, meal of the day. But <laughs> it, it's the fact that going back to smoking, Mm. that the trust and belief that we have in what people tell us um, and that's why brands are so important and that's why brands have a place in society but they ha can have a huge impact on how we feel about certain things so what's your take on the whole smoking thing then going way back what in terms of what's in, what in, the, in, what's in, in terms of in terms of, of the how they used it as a positive yeah, I mean, they they used the oldest trick in the book, didn't they? They just they just used it as sex. It was, you know, only cool people. It was, you know, there wasn't any sort of, you know, boring person in the adverts. It was all all to do with, um, you know, it was it was the lifestyle choice. It was you 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 bought into that into that look into that into that vogue, if you like. You know, the same way I buy an Apple computer because it says something about me. I think you know when you were smoking, it said something about you and and brand loyalty. I mean, having been a buyer. Um, I actually did quite a lot on the um, sort of analysis of tobacco and the brand loyalty is insane. Yeah, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, and tobacco is, you know, one of the biggest categories in, in uh, you know, one of the, one of the uh, certainly the most profitable um, because, you know, it's addictive, isn't it? So, uh, but yeah, we had to keep certain ranges and you'd be like, but we sell four of these a year. But you're like, yeah, but Mike in that particular, you know, petrol station, if he can't get his brand, he will start, you, you know, shopping in Shell. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think the brand loyalty was 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 mad. Um, I think they have they have done quite a lot in terms of I think the the going dark was a you know quite stressful um but really good idea mm. and I think I'm not entirely sure how um how you it'd be interesting I haven't done the research on it and I need to uh, on the you know having the adverts on the front of the packets because mm -hmm. I think if you if you're going to smoke you're going to smoke mm. um, so it'd be interesting to see I think what was I always had this idea of you know, rather than having any advertising on it, almost have it like brown paper and then in the cigarette packet have like a crayon so you can draw on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but obviously that's, you know, got a uh, childish connotation, so poss possibly not. But <laughs> sort of, yeah, the um, I think um, it, it, what amazes me is how long it took actually for smoking, you know, the, the dangers of smoking and, and the realities of, of, of sort of, you know, the consequences of it to actually filter into into consciousness mm. um into you know because people that were just for so long had accepted it you know in the war soldiers smoked to keep them going you know it was it was uh it was something that they needed um in a way you know a, a great um stress it was a stress reliever that's how it mm. was promoted i think um so yeah just the, just the fact that it became so pervasive in such a you know reasonably short amount of time actually if you think world war one 1940 um to today or to you know the, the sort of when it started becoming mm -hmm. you know <laughs> don't mm, no, it's a bad idea <laughs> I, yeah I, I think you're right and I think train uh, trends change and, and and what we learn about certain things has has a huge huge impact on yeah. um what we know like and trust in our particular brands uh mm -hmm. in, interesting I was told this so this this is going off what somebody told me rather than fact but I think it's fact so when when Steve Jobs um wanted to push and promote Apple computers he didn't just go he didn't go down the ad route he didn't just do that he didn't just think right okay I need to be everywhere all the time he gave them away to very influential people at the time mm -hmm. and it's just like 
I don't know whether that was quite unique in what he did at the time, but knowing and understanding that culture um, and knowing and understanding that if he gives it to influential people, that is far more influential than putting something in print in a certain magazine. I mean, that's, that's yeah. huge. Think about 1984. Like, I mean, that was a moment in time, that Super Bowl advert, and that cost him you know, I think nearly a million to create, mm-hmm. but that wasn't, that wasn't an advert. That was, a, that was a mini movie. You know, that was, that wasn't, you know, even now when I watch that, I get sort of, you know, skin prickles. It's just, it was so, he was so ahead of his time in terms mm. of um, understanding that that's what people wanted. I mean, now you get it all the time, you know, Lego movies and, you know, that was just a full feature advert. <laughs> Fundamentally it did really, really well for them. Um, you know, and again, that's a marketing department becoming, you know, almost profitable in its own right. Mm, um, yeah, absolutely. And as, that's a what... company, as opposed to selling Lego. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and kind of that's what marketing needs to be seen as it does. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a cost to a business. Yeah. It should be either a value or a profit creator. And there's so many ways. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's interesting. The, the most, the, the most innovate, innovative one I've seen over the past like few days is the, the Burger King and Stevenage link up. I don't know if you've seen yeah. that. Um, uh, well, that, that, so what they did was, and I don't know 100%, but basically um, Burger King sponsored Stevenage. Right. So when Stevenage were, were on um, a computer game in football, a football computer game, sorry, all their players had Burger <laughs> King on the top. So right. what Burger King did was say, they, they did a whole campaign around play a Stevenage and see how far you can get them. Sign the best players for Stevenage. You can buy the best players for Steve. And everywhere you went, it had Burger King on the top. Nice. So it was a, just unreal. Just they are, really they are brilliant. I loved what they did in Germany when um, COVID started because they had the the big six foot some uh, Burger King yeah. rounds that you could yeah. wear, which were hilarious. Mm-hmm. Didn't make it to the UK. I definitely would have bought one. <laughs> <laughs> I <thought you> would. <laughs> and the other thing I liked about Burger King is they they were always so they've done some very interesting LGBT um, pieces recently. Um, so there's a, a, a piece between Burger King and, and and Ronald McDonald, which I thought was very clever mm-hmm. and, and quite strong, quite powerful stuff. Um, but the other thing I liked about Burger King was they. Do you remember in I don't know um, twenty was it two thousand nine two thousand ten they did the um, delete ten Facebook friends and get a free whopper. Oh right, no, no, I didn't know. Well, that. So and they so Facebook closed them down eventually because they they actually um gave away two hundred thousand burgers. But I think what they really clicked into was actually, you know, how social media has fundamentally changed our understanding of friendships. Mm. Uh, in life, you know, if you I, I do an awful lot of work in speaking on social capital and the power of social capital and how that you know, the intrinsic value that you get from your relationships and how that relates to the psychology of marketing and all that sort of stuff. But what's really interesting that is, you know, if you look at the data, people only really have 150 relationships. Mm. You know, there's that, you know, if you think about um your your wedding list, that's kind of your your close circle. Whereas on Facebook, you can have, you know, thousands. LinkedIn, same again. Mm. Um, and what they really kicked into, and, and also like, who are you gonna call <laughs> for your free burger? And do you tell them, <laughs> you know, you were my whopper sacrifice, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was such a good, but I just thought that they it was very bold, mm. you know, to, to go, you know, even in 2009, 2010, because you know, Facebook wasn't wasn't what it is now um and I just yeah I thought that was very clever um the way that they sort of clicked into that cycle because it was a very simple call to action anybody could do it all you had to do was prove you deleted 10 friends and you get a free whopper um and I think it may you know who knows maybe on a behavioral level it made people think like actually you know yeah you're worth deleting for a burger <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'd, I'd, feel? <laughs> I'd, I'd put my hand up and go yeah, that's fine. I, I I know we're still mates. Just delete me. Like, if you want that whopper that much, just delete. I'm I'm comfortable with that that level of friendship. In fact, if you're going to tell someone you're going to delete them for the burger and they're happy with it, then you've got that level of relationship that's worth keeping offline. Really, to to be fair. Um, one thing first of all, um, Emma's not quite happy because she's from Stephen. She doesn't know what the hell's going on. So. <laughs> I'll send you the link, Emma, afterwards to, to what's going on. But it's putting Stevenage on the map. Then yeah. Mo Salah in a Stevenage top, for Christ's sake. You know, <laughs> you're winning on every level. Absolutely. Um, 
<laughs> but what what's what's interesting to me is the fact that you, you said like what Burger King do it is out there and it isn't and and it, it mm. you see a lot of innovative things that they do in terms of how they promote themselves and how they get in, in front of mass market. Yeah. Um, but yet McDonald's is the the market leader and yeah. they can't get close to McDonald's. So like what's with that? Surely in our marketing brain, it says that we have the most innovative, the most clever the most best, sorry, the best piece of, of comms, which is based on research and it's, it's a bit risky and it's out there because no one's doing what we do. Yet we can't get close to this market leader. But I don't, I think they, they differentiate like, you know, they're very different. Um, you know, you, it's a bit like, um, you know, cat or dog, isn't it? McDonald's or Burger King, you're either mm. one or the other. Uh, you know, for me, if I could have a Burger King burger with a McDonald's fries, like life, and the KFC gravy, like that is just <laughs> take out me. <laughs> um, to be honest, because I'm from Birmingham, so chips and gravy is like <laughs> a standard. Hey, look, look, I'm more northern than you are, so don't come with your chips and gravy here. Like, literally, we live on chips and gravy. It's like the sea is the River Mersey. Right. Yeah. Chips and gravy, come on. It's been it in Portsmouth. It's really rubbish, actually. There's no <laughs> gravy at all in, that I found. If anyone finds one, let me know. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My waistline doesn't, but, you know, it'd be quite nice every now and then. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I think – I think, um, but they're also doing a lot of, you know, again, um, they're, they're sort of building those partnerships, aren't they? I mean, again, I don't know much about Burger King and McDonald's um, mm. and sort of where they're going with the marketing strategy. Uh, I have to have a look at that. But um, – like I, you are seeing more. So they did that whole thing where I can't. One of them did a thing like, if you buy a burger, we'll give a load of money to charity. Yeah, they, I, I think that was Burger King again. Yeah, I and think. then McDonald's were like, go to Burger King because <laughs> we want them to give all the money to charity. So that was quite nice. Um, mm. You know, friendly sort of competitive collaboration in a way. Um, but I think I think um, you know they are they are very different. They stand for very different things i think the products are quite you know fun, although they're still burgers and whatever they are mm-hmm. quite different um, yeah massive so i think yeah it's again it's sort of standing in that sort of in you know being what you are and being okay with it and not trying to to be a me too type thing but i, I like i've got you know i think a lot of brands are now moving into this sort of social responsibility space and you mm-hmm. said earlier about how brands have you know they've got an awful lot of power and influence and and mm. what I'm liking at the moment is seeing more and more um, brands actually moving into that um, sort of space quite confidently. Um, so, you know, we talked about Super Bowl earlier. So Pepsi was one that um, I was thinking about at the time because they sponsored Super Bowl for like 23 years. And then one year they didn't. And it caused more fuss by the fact they didn't sponsor it than the fact they did. They got more press for it. Um, but what was interesting was they actually decided that year to spend that money on a uh, – it was like a, a grant, effectively, that projects – you know, if you had some good projects, mm. You could you could go to them and, and ask for money. Problem was, it, it then died a death about ten months later because of uh, it was covered in fraud allegations. So it actually did them more harm than good <laughs> at the end of it. But that's because it wasn't done properly. Um, yeah, you know, um, or with due diligence, shall we say? So, yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I thought you know it was quite a bold move to to put that mm. kind of money behind a behind a statement. And like um, you see, a lot of companies. Uh, now, now doing that, and, and what we've seen this year, I think more than 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 other years potentially, or certainly perhaps I've just become more aware of it. It's more in my, you know, like when you're buying a car and then all you see is car adverts. Maybe that's what. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <they're> doing. <laughs> but um, you know, there's a lot of companies, brands are now putting their foot down and saying, you know, this is what we, this is what we stand for, this is what mm. we believe, in, and this is what we're doing to to sort of actually show that it's more than words. And and and, and that that for me is is the the pivot point for me it's the this is what we're doing to show that that's our that's yeah. what we believe because uh, um and this you know I, you might have different feelings on this but when you see logos change to have rainbows in the background or you see them change to support certain things fantastic I'm, I'm not saying any of that isn't fantastic what i'm saying is that it needs to be more okay, than a year a month in a absolutely year. yeah but what happens when you move that rainbow yeah. Is, is that not important anymore or not important enough to be in your logo? It just opens a whole connotation that you don't, you don't need. And, yeah. and you can support things without being all ballsy about it. Cause people, <laughs> that, people will get to know about it. And the people that you want to know about it will, because they're the same type of people. 
Um, well, and the people that you want to draw in. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally, I think for me, you know, and a lot of people get called out on this in terms of, you know, a logo change, so what? It's not, you know, that's not, that's not action. I think going back, you know, what I'm finding, because we're now in the digital, you know, we're absolutely in the digital age and we, you know, mm-hmm. we've been about marketing um, since, you know, early noughties or whatever, um, really is when it, when it took off. But I think what we're finding now is because everything is digitized, we're losing trust. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it is that, that, you know, everyone's talking about value and integrity and authenticity, and we can use all the buzzwords, but fundamentally, you know, the results speak for themselves. So I'd much rather, you know, be working with a company that has, you know, can prove in their culture and can prove in their case mm-hmm. study and all of that sort of stuff, that they're actually doing tangible things rather than just, you know, sprinkling some glitter on a logo once in a blue moon. Um, I think that that's the key, sprinkling glitter on something. Yeah, that's that's what it, they're doing. Like, doesn't make a difference and actually what is really not well I say nice but what's really interesting is that you know because of social media and because of the power of social media companies that are just sprinkling glitter that are just using the buzzwords and not really meaning it you know they are getting called out again and yeah. again and what's really nice is the companies that are doing good stuff you know they're more likely to have what they're doing highlighted by others and and obviously because of social media and we can share it um you know that again is is you know those those cases and best practice if you like are, are mm. more to the fore so certainly during covid um you know very early on probably uh so lockdown was what 23rd of march so like mid april uh so i did a, i did a blog end of april which basically looked at how brands had had responded to the crisis in that first month mm. and it was very clear you know there were you know there were winners and losers um and you could just see from the social media participation like what people you know m- m- going back to mcdonald's mcdonald's did a split of their logo to show the social distancing and um, kfc took out the the finger licking which was just like actually that was that was a that was quite a clever little bit of that they have been yeah. very clever <laughs> yeah yeah um but there were lots of companies that had actually done done you know the the and what amazed me was just how companies could you know one day they're making this next day they're making that mm-hmm. you know, brew dog hand sanitizer you know yep. perfumes and, and things like that and just all, all the different ways that people were were able to you know the agility actually of some of these big companies really surprised me mm. um, and that was really interesting to see um, and i suppose that. you only get that with a company that is that is forward thinking and 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 possibly marketing orientated and thinking about the consumer first because anything other than that if you're sales focused if you're product focused you you haven't you won't have that that speed to react as quickly having your finger on the button absolutely like social listening and marketing is it's fundamental yeah uh, you know because a lot of people again with social just sort of you know it's post and go mentality isn't it it's like oh well I've done my thing on Facebook I've done my thing on LinkedIn today great I don't need to worry about that until tomorrow yeah whereas you know it's actually what I uh, the best bit I find about social media and and, you know what I I love talking about and teaching about is you know it's the social listening people give you so much data not just Mm. about what they're looking for in terms of product development or in terms of what they think about your competitors or you know um in terms of what they think about you and and whether you're on it or not people are talking about you and what you've got is this amazing ability to effectively walk into a room and hear what everyone's saying about you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's great. <laughs> mm-hmm. And using it to the best of your ability as well. That, that's, the, that's the thing that people don't get, the, the whole social impact and, so, sorry, social media and the impact it has. It's not necessarily the impact because we are who our feed says we are we're within reason, you know, and that's down to us to change that. But it's, it's, it's the fact that from a business perspective, don't see it as this thing that, you know, as you would see it if you were in a pub, you know, because it, it isn't that to a business. It's something different. You need to see beyond that. You know, you're not going to go online in a pub and go, oh, I wonder what people are saying about me. <laughs> you know, but from a business perspective, it's all there, yeah. like you said. Um, I'm talking to your client base as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, it, yeah, Innocent yeah. Smoothie doing the, 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 the recycled <laughs> item. <laughs> you've got to love them. Um, and I think they, they sold to a major corporation, didn't they? I can't remember who it was. I'm sure they did, um, but essentially one of the contracts, and this there's a few companies that have done it, but it said no, we need to stay true to our heritage. That's the only way we'll we'll sign the contract. Like Zappos yeah. sold to yeah. Amazon, but they were like, no, no, we need to keep our our heritage, our customer service, all that kind of stuff. And like, well, yeah, that's right. Their their conversations were legendary. 
I mean, yep. his book, um, you know, and the fact that, I mean, what I love about Tony Say is the fact that he moved his company headquarters, like, from the other side of the state because he couldn't find the right people to pick up the phone. That's insane, isn't it? Because, you know, even though they're an e-commerce site, you know, people could buy online, he realised that it, was, it wasn't just the touch point when you buy, it was all the other touch points that mm-hmm. really, you know, made it. Um, and I, I took quite a lot from that, I, you know, in terms of invoicing and, and my privacy policy. So I made my privacy policy on my website really fun. And I, it's amazing the amount of people that messaged me going, I've just read your privacy policy. <laughs> um, because, you know, most people don't. It's just one of those little nuggets that most people, you know, just stick a, a you know, a boilerplate. Um, but actually, there is a way of making the, the, any any touch point with a, with a customer quite, quite fun. And, and I think that's the point of marketing at the end of the day is, you know, for me, it's about it's about communicating clearly what you do for people, how you do it, and how you make mm-hmm. it. Different. But I think also, like fundamentally, um, I can't remember who said it. There was a great quote that was, you know, the longest journey humans take is the eighteen inches between their head and the heart, and that really <laughs> struck me actually because mm. it's emotion, it's it's an enthusiasm. So with marketing, all you have to do really is is get people to feel the way you feel about whatever it is that you're marketing. Um, and and that's and that's how you how you sort of create those um, those huge brand ambassadors really. And I think that's becoming you know talking about marketing today. You know we've talked about it's been mostly outbound, hasn't it? It's been you know if you think about through history, it's been mostly shouting at people through post mm-hmm. trade cards. We didn't talk about trade cards <laughs> like in the seventeen oh my god seventeen hundred <laughs> trade cards with like tiny little miniatures of the stuff they were selling and then they'd give them to people and get them to give them to their friends <laughs> so fun. anyway um but yeah so um I've totally lost my train of thought now yeah outbound but um now obviously it's more about having those conversations having having those sort of relationships with people and and just listening I think a lot more and and not pretending that you know the answer I think you know some of the best some of the best um advertising and some of the best marketing that I see is like his concept you know, we haven't even finished this yet. Like, help us build it. Like, let's yeah. make it better than even what we're thinking of. Um, or, you know, having an argument like Innocent did with the blue and green smoothies. I loved that. <laughs> that was just brilliant. You know, such clever, clever marketing. Um, and that's that's the fun. That's the engagement, you know, the emotion, the 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 joy, I suppose. Of, but but it, it's and, – and you said a few things there, but – like the, the final word was joy and that's an emotion <laughs> and that's that's linking it's it's not selling um you know Seth, one of seth godin's first books and it's so it's bizarre because i read it the other day but it's about viruses and how no. viruses spread yeah and um he basically says like you you don't market a service or a product you market an idea yeah. and you get that idea to spread and if it's an idea then there's some emotion attached to it but it's weird because he goes on about sneezes sneezes and how you have big sneezes and small sneezes and you want the big sneezes to sneeze over everyone so they sneeze over other people i mean talk about topical for the times we live in but unreal and this was this was one of the first books he wrote yeah, um but yeah it, 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 it's all about you don't have to sell your product you just yeah. have to be part of the conversation because nobody wants the car salesman they want that conversation you know, yeah. they want to be part of building that product. They want that co-creation. And that's, I think, again, um, the bit that, that people well, miss. You're adapted that way, aren't you? And I think the other thing is loyalty. So with that comes loyalty. So, you know, we mm. people with vouchers and points cards and things like that. But we're basically just paying people to give us their data because, you know, yeah. Time you use a Tesco card or you know a whatever card it tells you exactly what you bought, so they know how to. There was a horrible um, a- article that came out when I was about fifteen, sixteen, where um, I think I can't remember one of the one of the retailers had started sending. Um, in the post like vouchers for baby things and the dad got really annoyed because he was like no he's pregnant and then like literally two weeks later, his daughter was pregnant and she was crying yeah. and it was really like the, it's basically Sainsbury's I don't know which company it was but you know it was in this instance just just hypothetically in my mind saying it's Sainsbury's or something um you know they knew before before the family did because of what she was buying and that's insane the amount mm. of like, sort of sophistication that had gone into that um, no, it was ta- it was Target in America, yeah. but I think it is about that co creation. I think it is about mm. um, you know if people feel invested in an idea, if they feel like they've they've uh, you know done something with it in some way, 
or, or had van- you know, every, what everybody wants at a basic fundamental level, um, I think is to is to be valued and to be recognised and be and to be part of something. You know, that goes back to our sort of uh, tribes, our you know, mm-hmm. mentality sort of thing. You know, it kept us alive, and I think um, you know that's what we need to bring to bear in marketing today. And and social me- media is is the way to do that. It, you know, it gives you mm. such an incredible tool and what what annoys me so much is the fact that so many people are just using it as a post and go they're using it as a digital billboard and and that's you know that just robs it of all its magic so Uh, (laughs) so so, say it against the post and go (laughs) yeah yeah no more post and goes please thank you uh so uh, i just want to kind of wrap up here a little bit because i'm I'm, I'm conscious conscious of time and stuff like that i don't want to take your your evening away just say that that um emma was saying that she loved the innocent uh smoothie social and and advertising and it's moved on to social from from what used to be an email good use of different channels there and all that kind of stuff and yeah they did keep control of of the brand and um it was coca-cola that that bought them uh, on the premise that they kept the brand and you can see that because you wouldn't necessarily know their uh, purchased yeah. by Coca Cola. I just want to say be- before we before we leave that um, check out the privacy privacy policy um, <laughs> on on um, uh, um, <laughs> um So yeah, let me let me uh, wrap up. So we, we've talked about we've talked about uh, tractors. We've talked about toothpaste. We've talked about smoking. We've talked about uh, advertising, um, cards, <laughs> social media. <laughs> Sorry, what? We talk about Jello. That was the other thing. Was um, Jello did a recipe book. And that led to a million pounds worth of sales in 1906. And that, like, food brands should be doing that now, like giving yeah. away free recipes and free recipe books. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, but but on that, Sainsbury's did it with Jamie Oliver. So yeah. Jamie Oliver was on uh, recipe cards that you could pick up in Sainsbury for free, and you got oh, a little foot. What well, you did that as well? Waitrose did. Oh, okay. They- Cards. I love yeah. them. They're I mean, fun. what what the hell are you going to do with that? You're going to go around the shop and buy all the stuff to make a Jamie Oliver recipe. It's yeah, like yeah. you're not saying <laughs> buy my stuff. You're just saying this is a guy who knows how to cook. If you want to cook one of his recipes, here's all the stuff. Yeah, love it. It's really just helping. Good. Yeah, absolutely. So the well, the the, yeah. the, <laughs> the, 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 the your website's on on the screen now. Uh, but if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to get in touch with you and say, um, tell me the history of marketing. <laughs> LinkedIn, absolutely. So um I, I I'm pretty much um yeah, I use it as my inbox at the moment, I think. <laughs> yeah. to in touch with that, yeah. Cool. And I, I, will, I will write some of this up actually. I, I, I mean I don't I don't know how much I'll remember, but <laughs> I'll uh, I'll try and write it up as kind of some interesting examples through history, maybe. <laughs> I love it, and that'll be on the site, I'm taking it. Yeah, yeah. Well yeah, like, yeah. Probably, probably probably a couple of weeks. Give me a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> what? I it by tomorrow. Well, a long time. <laughs> all the, get, got to check all the royalties on the images and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Love it. Right, um, thank you so, so much for joining yeah, me. It's been, yeah, really we, we could talk about this all night. I've had some amazing guests on the past, like, I've only been doing it a couple of weeks, but had yeah. some amazing guests, which I wish this was like three or four hours, but conscious of time and stuff like that. Yeah. And yeah, I just really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for for doing yeah. what you do and, and, and keep up with the, the engagement on social and posting stuff about history and as soon as you get all that typed up, let me know and I'll I'll share it as much as I can. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. It was lovely to chat as always. <laughs> okay. Cool. Fantastic. So right. I'm, 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 um, and oh, well, there you go. Oh, oh thanks, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> I am in the process of writing a book. It's called Stop Blaming the Goldfish and Other Good Marketing Advice. So I might get that finished first and then add this one as like volume two. <laughs> There, there you go. There you go. Emma, we'll keep you informed of, of that book. Um, I'll write the forward to it and take 4% of the royalties, but that's to be discussed <laughs> off camera. So, uh, Emma, finally, thank you so, so much for joining me. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, as always. Right, I'm going to go now. I'm going to do this weird wave thing that I've got into a habit of doing. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, and this this isn't me. This is from a guy called Ryan Foland, who who I saw him do it. But you do you do a high five to, to leave. So, oh, no other way. Okay. Other way. There you go. High five. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for listening and staying with me till the end. Not many people do on podcasts. If you want to chat a bit more marketing, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. Email me at petersumpton at marketingstudylab.co.uk or join our Facebook group, Growing and Thriving. Just search for Marketing Study Lab on Facebook. Happy marketing. Happy marketing.